Searching for the truth is never easy. It seems like today one man's lies is another man's truth. And you know, the media doesn't make it any easier. They have those emotion-laden titles and they use words to invoke an emotion uh, that they support an opinion they support or their publisher supports. You know, I just kind of want the facts and then come up with my own conclusions. Now, there's a place for editorials and opinion pieces, but I just don't think they should be in the regular news that's given out to the masses. Instead, that should be facts, and then you say, this is an opinion piece, this is editorial, and keep them separate. But that doesn't seem to happen today, does it? So, one of the things I find myself doing is trying to find facts behind something. You know, when I, I, I don't like it when I'm told this is what I should believe. I want to know why I should believe it. What's the logic behind it? What are the facts behind it? Just don't tell me this is what you believe. Because you know what? I am a skeptic by nature. <laughs> and that, that will mean I'm not going to believe it if you force it down my throat. You know, in science, I always thought things were kind of pure and, you know, people welcomed diverse opinions so you could talk back and forth and everything would be reviewed by their peers when they're published and we would have a lot of data available to share and I thought by nature every scientist should be a skeptic because that's the only way to remain objective. But that doesn't seem to happen either. And that's because of certain factors. We have, I think, number one, funding. Where do they get the money, right? They might have to go along with certain beliefs to be able to get that money. And politics. Politics are telling science what you should print. And that is not right. And then there's egos. And egos of scientists can be rather large, and they don't like being disputed with. So you combine that all together, and you can have quite a mess and chaos. So science isn't pure, and science facts aren't always facts either. Now, I realize that facts can kind of be fluid, you know? What we think is factual now Science makes certain um, advances and we learn something new. So it changes the facts, right? But, you know, I felt very uncomfortable when at the start of the pandemic, we were just told, I am sorry, it came from zoonotic sources. It did not escape from a lab in Wuhan or somewhere else. We were just told, it's racist to think about that. And that completely threw me for a leap. Racist? Because this might be a plausible theory. So now we're piling, you know, there's politics on it. And uh, it started to really confuse me. And we weren't able to call it the Wuhan virus, which is fine because a lot of viruses, yes, we know them by their supposedly point of origin. But if you think of it, um, the Spanish flu did not originate from Spain and Ebola was from, I don't know, like 60 miles or more away from the Ebola River where it really originated from. But you know what? People get that confused too. COVID-19 is the disease, but the virus is really called SARS-CoV-2, is it? Again, not very catchy. I do laugh how, you know, the media has went along with everything and calls uh, basically disease and virus COVID-19. But the variants, they're just as happy to say, hey, it's an Indian variant or a Brazilian variant. They don't care about that. That doesn't seem to be racist. Hmm. Now, in honest truth, they do have scientific names. The Indian variant 
is also sometimes called Delta variant or, I have to look this one up, B1617. So anyway, I'm kind of digressing, but you might have thought by the title, what does she mean, the Pinterest research method? What is that? Well, I just kind of coined that for myself because if any of you have ever been on Pinterest, you know maybe you're looking for a recipe or a craft and you click on something and all of a sudden you find yourself two hours later because you've been clicking, oh, that sounds interesting, and then, oh, that looks really good, and you keep on going, right? And you might even forget what you originally went on Pinterest board for. But that's kind of sometimes the way I do my research. I see something interesting, I click on that, that makes me click on something else, and then from there I go somewhere else. So sometimes what I'm even looking for is not what I end up with, but it is always interesting. So in a recent um, publication from the New York Times, they cited an article entitled, The Genetic Structure of SARS-CoV-2 Does Not Rule Out a Laboratory Origin. SARS-CoV-2 is chimeric structure and fern cleavage site might be the result of a genetic manipulation. Now, I have to emphasize, the article does not say that it did occur from a lab escape. It just says, could be possible. I thought the article was interesting and it was put in pretty basic language, but some of the science was still beyond my knowledge. So I thought, hmm, well, the two authors don't know the names. Are they really experts in their field? Should I believe what they're stating? So, yep, another click. So Rosanna Segreto, I found out she was staff at the Department of Microbiology at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. But wait a minute. She's only a technical assistant, not listed as faculty. And her interest on the website states soil microbiology and mycology. Hmm. So it looked to me like her expertise was more in mushrooms, right? But then I did a little more research and I found out, I think it was her dissertation, um, the thesis was on fruit bats and I believe genetic um, manipulation. So maybe she does have some experience in this field and she is a microbiologist. Now let's click on the other name. That's Yuri Degnan, Dynan, can't pronounce it, D-E-I-G-I-N. He lists himself as a biotech businessman and he is the founder of Eutherium Genetics Inc. And according to their website, their mission is searching for a cure for aging um, in short, they're trying to develop an epigenetic rejuvenation gene therapy of aging. Okay, sounds a little out there, but I don't know much about it, but I know a lot of countries, especially Asia, is looking into anti-aging. So, definitely interesting. He doesn't actually do the lab experiments in-house. He funds them elsewhere. But, okay, interesting. I believe he was Russian-born and he lives in Canada now. So I do a little bit more sleuthing. It turns out both of them are members of an online group called Drastic, or the Decentralized Radical Autonomous Search Team. Now, I found this group utterly fascinating. Um, it's a bunch of scientists in various countries, many of them are just anonymous, and they didn't quite believe the Kool-Aid, right? They didn't quite believe, why are we ruling out a lab leak? So they have banded together, I think it was on Twitter initially, and tried to find proof if it was a lab leak. And actually, they have found some pretty surprising things. So, both of these authors were part of Drastic. You know, you read this article and you realize what a great movie this would make. I mean, we have US cover-up, China cover-up, a shady scientist or scientists. We have the Batwoman, right? We have very scary experimentation called 
gain of function. And we have politics on top of it all. So this article really did a great job of putting together a lot of the different stuff I had been researching into one article. And I really, really urge you to read it in full. And I'm going to go over some of the points now. But I want to say this article also doesn't say that, yes, the virus escaped from a lab. Again, jump to conclusions without conclusive proof. Basically, it's just saying there is no conclusive proof for zoonotic because we haven't found the animal it jumped from. And the same is for the lab. We haven't found proof that it is a lab leaked virus. Now, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, um, we already know, right? They research bats. That is the home to the bat woman which she's a marvelous scientist. Uh, she, Zeng, Zengili, Zengli, oh, let's just call her she. I hope that's right too, it's S-H-I. Um, she is known as an expert in her field and she's not afraid to go out in the field and collect her bat samples. I mean, she has done some amazing research and she's really head of this lab. Then we have the famous Lancet article that was published in March of last year. And basically a group of scientists banded together and put this in the Lancet. It's a statement in support of the scientists, public health professionals, and medical professionals of China combating COVID-19 and denying a lab origin of the virus. Quote, the rapid open and transparent sharing of data on this outbreak is now being threatened by rumors and misinformation around its origins. We stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. And a lot of these were experts in their field. So, okay. Still the question is, does it completely rule out that lab incident? Wasn't proven, just like slap. You can't believe it, right? Well, then you delve into that a little deeper, and then we get into our shady scientist, and that is Peter Danzek. He's a zoologist, and he is the head, uh, the president of Equal Health Alliance, and his mission is to prevent the outbreak of emerging diseases by safeguarding ecosystems. Well, I mean, that sounds really good, right? Well, guess what? In 2014, right before, I guess about five months before Obama announced the moratorium on gain-of-function research, he got an NIAID grant of roughly about $3.7 million, which he allocated to various entities collecting bat samples, building models, and performing gain-of-function experiments to see which animal viruses were able to jump to humans. Yikes, right? Well, by 2018, he was getting 15 million a year from the US, from the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security. And where did some of this money go? Yep, it went to the Wuhan lab, right? Hmm, it's starting to smell just a little, isn't it? Let's dig a little deeper. Well, guess what? Peter Danzig is the one that got all these scientists together to publish that letter in The Lancet. Okay, he's an expert about this. That's not so fishy. But it, under a Freedom of Information Act, this email was obtained. Under the subject line, no need for you to sign the statement, Ralph, he wrote to two scientists, including University of North Carolina's Dr. Ralph Barrick, who had collaborated with she, the Batwoman, on the gain-of-function study that created a coronavirus capable of infecting human cells. Quote, you, me, and him should not sign the statement, so it has some distance from us and therefore doesn't work in a counterproductive way, unquote. Then he added, we'll then put it out in a way 
that doesn't link it back to our collaboration so we maximize an independent voice. Wow, that, that, that sounds shady, doesn't it? Now maybe he just had really strong beliefs and didn't want his funding to interfere with those beliefs. But, you know, that's not very transparent, is it? Well, then the U.S. also kind of said, nope, didn't escape from a lab. And various agencies were told, you can't look any further, stay out of it. Now, why would the United States be covering it up? Well, I think it's probably just because they didn't want it widely accepted out in the media that they were funding experiments in Wuhan, especially what would happen if one of those experiments was the reason this virus escaped. So the U.S. covers it up. Well, then we have China. And, you know, I shouldn't say China. It is the Communist Party of China. It's not the Chinese people. It's the Communist Party. They are very much into withholding information, and we know that for a long time. Well, in this case, they shut down that Hunan market, ordered laboratory samples destroyed, claimed the right to review any scientific research about COVID-19 ahead of publication, and even expelled a team of Wall Street Journal reporters. Now, the government wasn't able to squash a paper that went out from two college students, university students, I think they were working on their masters, um, it appeared, but it, then it was quickly taken off the internet. But people had found that. And you know what it said? Well, listen to this. They looked at this and they said, how did that virus get to such a big metropolis, a city with 11 million people? If, it, if there weren't bats sold at the market and it's in the dead of winter when most bats are hibernating, how did it get there? Well, their conclusion was that it escaped from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Granted, taken down really quick. But you know what? Lab accidents do happen. Um, that drastic group I was talking about, they found four such accidents. In fact, um, two occurred at a top laboratory in Beijing, and due to overcrowding, a live SARS virus has been improperly deactivated and it was moved to a refrigerator in a corridor and a grad student examined it in an electron microscope room and sparked an outbreak. We also um, had information that they weren't, the Wuhan Institute of Virology wasn't quite up to the U.S. standards and protocols. And so we knew this. So our U.S. intelligence looked at open sources and classified sources, and they found that she, the Batwoman, and Dr. Barrick from the University of North Carolina, an epidemiologist, had worked on a paper together. Let me tell you what it's about. They proved that the spike protein of a novel coronavirus could infect human cells. They used mice as subjects. They inserted protein from the Chinese horseshoe bat into the molecular structure of the SARS virus from 2002, and they created a new infectious pathogen. The authors themselves thought this experiment was dangerous because they put, quote, scientific review panels may dim, deem similar studies too risky to pursue, unquote. Now, the paper's acknowledgement cited funding from the U.S. National Institute of Health and from a nonprofit called EcoHealth Alliance, which had parceled our grant money from the U.S. Agency for International Development. I mentioned gain of function. If you don't know what gain of function is, you should do a little research in it, okay? Basically, you're changing the virus's function so it does something else. Well, it can be dangerous. And these gain of function experiments have raised a number of biosafety concerns. So, on one hand, it's to help prevent a virus, but on the other hand, they could cause a virus, right? Kind of scary stuff. And that drastic group again, they did some more research and they found a paper about the Mojiang miners. This was really interesting. 
uh, these poor gentlemen, six gentlemen, were given the task of going in a mine there that had a heavy bat population. And there was all this um, guano, which is bat poop, right, on the floor. I mean, piles. And they had the task of shoveling it all out of the mine. Well, guess what? Six of, I should say, I don't know if it was initially six, but six of them came down with a mysterious disease. It turned out their symptoms were cough, fever, and labored breathing, which were very similar to SARS. And three of them died. And blood samples were taken. And guess where they went back to? Yup, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And people from there and other place scientists came to that mine to get samples from rodents that were in there and the bats themselves because they had never heard of a virus going directly from a bat to a human. There's usually that intermediate host, right? So, a lot of samples taken. Where did some of those go? Back to that institute, you're right. Now, I'm not gonna go through all the <laughs> different things, but there's something called the RATG13 that was in the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And, you know, the lab kind of said, or I should say she from the Institute kind of kind of gave us different studies on this. But anyway, that they didn't have any other samples, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? Drastic found that the RATG13 appeared identical to RABTCOV backslash 4991 which was the virus from the shaft where the miners fell ill in 2012. And it looked like COVID-19. So they asked questions and it kept story changing. And then, um, cause they said they had released out all of their um, data. And then they said they renamed that data, that, that actual sequence um, to make it easier to categorize. But anyway, again, another cover-up going on. Not all the true story. Who knows? Now, in October of last year, um, a team from, I think it was the BBC, actually tried to go to that mine. They wanted to investigate, and they were blocked. The row was blocked. They could not get in. Again, pretty darn suspicious. And remember the WHO, um, international team that went to investigate the virus. Guess who the United States representative was? Yeah, Peter Danzig. He was the one again. Even though when we had sent a list into who, we had suggested other people, he wasn't on our list. He was picked. Again, conflict of interest, right? Money has changed hands between that institute and him. But maybe they picked him because they thought he was knowledgeable and he was more trusted by the people over there. That is possible too. Got to be careful when you read into these things. But I did not know until I read this article that, you know, I thought it was a fact-finding mission to find out the origin of COVID-19. And that's not true. The resolution actually from the World Health Assembly called not for a full inquiry into the origin of the pandemic, but instead for a mission, quote, to identify the zoonotic source of the virus, end quote. So that's it. You have to find that it came from an animal source, nothing else to be considered. Again, definitely a cover up. And this of course, I'm sure was on China's side but very, very unfortunate. And maybe the WHO agreed to it because they thought at least they can get people in there and maybe they can get some other information. Again, don't know the full story. And then we find out just recently that there was a state classified document that even though she and the Institute had said no one had been sick in that time period or before from any virus-like symptoms, we find out three people in November had to be 
November of 2019, had to be hospitalized all from the Institute with very similar symptoms. Now again, we got to remember, those symptoms are very similar to the flu, right? So maybe a coincidence. But gosh, we're getting a lot of coincidences, aren't we? So anyway, read the darn article and then keep clicking on things and get your own research map. But, you know, the longer the period goes from the origin, the harder it's going to be to get information, especially considering the country of origin. But this whole thing is fascinating. I have to pat on the back the members of Drastic who went against their colleagues and said, I'm going to pursue something. And I think it has made all of us aware that what we are told is not always the full truth. Well, I mean, come on, we already know that, right? But in this case, we were told to trust science, but we couldn't because science was told, don't do anything, right? I mean, kind of just amazing. So this is going to be interesting to keep on getting information and maybe we will never know the true story of the origin. But at least we are trying to pursue. And zoonotic still makes a lot of sense because we have other coronaviruses that do pass from actual bat to, you know, an animal such as, what's it, camel for MERS, and then to human. So it is still a very real possibility. But just want to share this article with you and in search of truth. Now, if you use that Pinterest method, I want to caution you a bit because when you keep on clicking, you could be just clicking on things that are one train of thought. So your mind only goes one way instead of opening it up and going both ways. Always when you're investigating something, try to do the pros, cons, or alternative methods too. But I bet a lot of you out there also kind of do that Pinterest research method. And boy, is this controversy amazing. This is Prepper Potpourri saying, hey, the truth is out there, but I don't know if we can find it.